Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Farah, and in today's video, this is gonna be my November reading wrap up for the month. So for November, I did participate in a couple different challenges and I ended up reading six books. Of the challenges I did, I did the Read What You Own challenge and I was able to get to three books off of my shelves, which is great because that's one of my goals for the year is to try to read three books off of my shelves each month. So I did um, complete that, which was great. I also participated in Nonfiction November and I celebrated National American Heritage Month or Indigenous Peoples Month. So let's get started with the books. Now right off the bat, there's two books that I'm not going to really talk about. I started them in November, but I just didn't have a chance to get through them all the way. And the first one is The Heartbeat at Wounded Knee, uh, Native American History from 1890 through the present. This was supposed to be for Historathon and to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Month. And I started listening to the audio. This is a book that I already owned, as you can tell. And the audio was so incredibly good and I kept trying to tab, but doing the audio while trying to listen to this was really difficult because I found that the information and the storytelling was so good and it was so fascinating that I felt like I was gonna be missing stuff. So I put the audio away, I returned it to the library. I'm gonna pick this back up once my current nonfiction read is done, just so I can really, really enjoy it and read through this and tab this properly. So didn't get to finish this one, but this is definitely gonna be ongoing over the next couple months. And then the other book that you guys have seen me vlog about and talk about is An Immense World by Ed Young. This is incredible, such an amazing book. I'm just reading it really slowly, a chapter, maybe half a chapter a night, and I've gotten about this way through. A lot of this is like, you know, the glossary and things like that. So I'm actually about 75% done with this and I hope to finish this within this week, but not gonna talk about this one either. So as for the books that I did complete, I ended up reading two books for November, which is to try to read a romance novel during the month of November. I read two nonfiction books. I read one YA fantasy and I read one horror. So a couple of those were novellas, really short reads, but all of them are really good. Like I had a really, really good reading month. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the lowest rank and move my way up to my favorite book of the month. So the first book I wanna just briefly talk about is People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. And this was my pick for November. This is a rom-com, romantic comedy. It's about 400 pages long and it is told in the first person point of view by our main character whose name is Poppy. So this book, it follows two characters named Poppy and Alex, and they have been best friends since college. They met in college. Poppy, as a career, works as a travel journalist. So she writes travel pieces for a really famous magazine. So she, for her job, she has to do a lot of traveling. So for one week out of the summer, her best friend Alex comes with her and goes on vacation while she's working. So the book is told in a dual timeline point of view. So we're getting the present day where Alex and Poppy's relationship as a friends has kind of been torn apart. We don't really know why, but for some reason they're not, you know, friends or close anymore. The other timeline goes back 10 years prior and it talks about each vacation every single summer going forward until the timelines merge together at the end. So what I liked about this book is that Emily Henry is really funny. Her writing was really funny. So I found a lot of humor throughout the book. I laughed out loud many times throughout while I was reading this. The characters were really realistic and flawed. You felt like you knew who they were in real life. They had very, uh, you know, relatable personality quirks and flaws that you would see in everyday people. And I thought that she writes um, banter really well, just in terms of conversations back and forth. Um, there were some deeper meanings towards the end of the book, which were very heartfelt. And I did feel that, you know, that nice lovey feeling within myself. But overall, I probably would give this three and a half stars because I felt as though it was way too long for the story that was being told. I would have preferred if it was a one singular slow burn timeline starting back from when they were friends up to the present. I would have felt like that would have worked better personally for me. Um, I also felt like it was a lot of focus on these two characters by themselves talking. So it was very dialogue heavy and you kind of felt like you were just trapped in the room with them while they're just bantering back and forth over and over and over, skirting over their feelings. This is a friends to lover trope. So, uh, you know, I felt that the platonic friendship was so unrealistic. I mean, two people, a man and a woman, both heterosexual, um, get together, there's alcohol involved, they're both equally attracted to each other and nothing has happened within that 10 years. It just felt very unrealistic to me. Each vacation that they took felt very repetitive in terms of 
what went on. There wasn't a lot of uh, variety within the vacations. Even though they were traveling to different places, I just kind of felt like I, I'm glad I had the physical copy because I kept having to go back in the book and figure out where we were, which timeline we were in. So again, the timeline didn't work, but I think if you really enjoy romance, you might really enjoy this book. It just wasn't really a book for me. So the next book I read for the Read What You Own Challenge was called The Christmas Blessing. And I already passed this along to my mom, so I no longer have the physical copy. But I listened to this actually as audio through my library. It's a really short novella. It's about three hours long. Uh, the book itself is under 200 pages. And it's, uh, fo it's a follow-up book to the original book in the series called Christmas Shoes, which you guys may have heard of. It's a pretty popular Christmas song here in the US. It tells the story of this little boy whose mom unfortunately is dying from cancer and he wants to go to the store and buy her a pair of shoes that she can wear so that she can be beautiful when she goes to heaven. So it's a very sad story. I mean, that book, that book was really good and it made me cry and it was really heartwarming and just a beautiful story. But this book focuses on that little boy now that he's older and he's in his early 20s and he's a medical student working under a physician in the specialty of pediatric cardiology. So a lot of the book takes place in a hospital setting. It has a very Hallmark movie vibe to it. It's a very unrealistic, cozy hospital setting, if you know what I mean. You know, like they're having trick-or-treating for the kids and they're decorating and they're, you know, very minimal stress as I've worked in a children's unit on a hospital and I can tell you it's not realistic. But so we're following Nathan, who is sort of questioning his choice about being a medical doctor. One of his patients unfortunately passes away and he feels a lot of guilt towards that. I think the writing was beautiful and it really captured that new feeling of working in a hospital and not really knowing what you're doing and, you know, questioning your instincts and things like that. So that was great. But Nathan meets another patient named Megan, who's 19. She's in college. She's a really good runner, but she was born with a heart defect. It's a love story. It's very Christian faith-based. Um, if you're not into that, you're not going to like it. But if you're looking for just a really cozy, uh, sweet, heartfelt, heartwarming story, no spiciness, you know, there's none of that. The, all you get is a kiss. You know, that's the extent of the, the steaminess. But it was, it was cute. I enjoyed it. I'm glad I read it. I would probably give it 3.5 stars. Um, you know, it, it wasn't enough for me to be like fully, wow, this was great. Not like the first one, but it did have that cute, cozy feel. Virtually not a lot of Christmas theming though. I wouldn't save this for Christmas. You could read it anytime. Just the, like the last scene happens on Christmas or something like that. But the writing itself was really beautiful and it had some really nice messages in it. And you know, it's a reminder that sometimes when we go through a loss, like a parental loss or a trauma or losing someone really close to us, it's so hard, but at the same time, it really brings you a lot of growth and compassion that you can help other people that are in the same situation. And I think it broadens your perspective of the world and your appreciation of others. So I really enjoyed that particular kind of theme throughout the book. And it was nice to see Nathan again as a character and kind of see what happens to him. And it was, it was cute, but I recommend the first one if you're going to read either. So the next book I read for the Read What You Own Challenge is called Alatsue by Darcy Little Badger. And this book um, also counted towards my Native American Heritage Month reads. So this is a YA fantasy. It's about 360 pages-ish or so. And I actually, even though I have the physical book, I listened to this while I was working and uh, it had fantastic audio. So this book tells the story of 17-year-old Alatsue, or as she's known mostly in the book, Ellie as she investigates the murder of her cousin. Ellie is part of the Lapan Apache tribe and the setting is now, so it's uh, you know present day, but it's magical realism. So everything about the world is the same, except there are elements of magic within the story. Ellie has the ability to raise the spirits of dead animals, which is a, a knowledge that's been passed down to her from her grandmothers, like all the way up, up back to her sixth great grandmother. Her mother has this ability. A lot of the females in her family have this ability. So right away, we know that she has a companion who was a dog named Kirby who passed away a couple years ago, but she's been able to raise his spirit up and he's a constant companion that she can call on anytime. Right away, that was super sweet and cozy. <laughs> Um, but it's kind of like it had a Scooby-Doo mystery type of vibe, a bunch of kids getting together to solve this mystery that really the adults should have been handling, but the kids kind of took it upon themselves. Ellie is a very likable character and she has her best friend Jay, 
Um, the friendship is completely platonic and it's told at some point in the book just very briefly that Ellie is asexual. So that I thought was amazing because she does say another time like, well, you know, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have kids. But it's not dwelled upon. It's mentioned just as you would mention the color of somebody's eyes and it's fully accepted. And I just thought that was really nice to have a female character have that particular trait about her because you know, there are people like that, that feel that way. And there are women and girls that don't ever want kids. They don't want to get married. They're not thinking about it. And so it was nice to have that representation within the book. The magical part was really cool. There are scenes where Ellie is resurrecting, you know, prehistoric animals. And there's a really cool scene that I'm not going to say, but um, I felt the friendship between her and Jay was really beautiful. It was completely platonic. Everything between them was so sweet and kind. It was such a great example of a supportive friendship. And I just, I really liked the writing. The writing was beautiful. And I liked the indigenous storytelling within the book, going back in time and hearing some of her grandmother's stories, the upon the Pachi cultural references. Of course, there were some deeper themes going into colonialism and dispossession. Um, but I thought that the magical realism carried the story enough where it would keep a younger reader occupied and engaged within those topics as opposed to just a flat out contemporary YA. So this did read a little young. Um, it went into darker themes, but it was handled very, you know, watered down in a sense. It was funny. I really enjoyed this. I gave this four stars and I'm definitely going to pass this along to my daughters to read if they're interested. But I don't think you have to be young to read this. I think as an adult, you can really enjoy this um, and get a lot out of it as well. Okay, and the next book I read, and to be honest, I may have read this in early December. I'm filming this on the 7th, so I can't remember if this counts for November or December, but whatever. I'm just going to include it in this one. But this was a graphic novel that I got from my library called Gender Queer. And this is part of a project that I'm working on for the upcoming year, but I thought I'd start a little early. And this is part of the read uh, band books 24 in 2024, which just just a challenge to yourself to pick out some banned books and read them and just, you know, kind of support the freedom of speech and that kind of thing. So gender queer was at the top of a lot of these banned book lists. So it was definitely on my radar as one I wanted to read. It's a memoir talking about what it feels like to grow up as a non-binary and a sexual person. So this was a great memoir. I found it very moving. I felt like I learned a lot and it gave me a, such a more open perspective on what non-binary people and asexual people might feel as they're growing up. You know, it's already awkward enough when your hormones start to come into play and everybody around you starts liking different people and is attracted to different people. But what must it feel like if you don't have those feelings and you don't have those emotions? Growing up, I always strongly felt female. I always felt very feminine and I, I still always feel that way. So it's difficult sometimes for me to imagine what it's like for a non-binary person to not have that strong association of their gender. So I felt like the graphic novel was really well done to create that picture for me. It was very, very honest. It was very raw, very personal. There are a lot of topics that the author goes into that a little like shook me by surprise a little bit, but I appreciated the fact that the author, you know, felt comfortable sharing that and bringing that to light and giving a voice to that, that might be so helpful for other people feeling that way. So the illustrations were really great. Um, my only critiques, if I had to say, this is why I didn't give it a full five stars, are that I felt like the timeline of the novel was a little bit off. It bounced around a little bit and I've read enough graphic novels where I can appreciate like the structure of a graphic novel and how it can hit you in different ways. So I thought maybe the structure of the pacing of the graphic novel was a little bit odd for me, but not a deal breaker by any means. But you know, that's just me being picky. So overall, I thought it was a great book. This is recommended. I think the author recommended it for 14 plus, but I think on Amazon, if you look it up, it does say 18 plus. Just knowing if you wanna read this, there's topics about sex. There's graphically illustrated um, illustrations of sex. You know, I think it's a great novel and I'm glad that it's out there and I'm glad that it gives a voice to people that might be feeling the same way. So fantastic graphic novel. I really enjoyed it and I'm glad I read it. Okay, next I want to just talk about another great book that I read this month and this was a 
short horror novella called What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher. This is my first book by this author and definitely not going to be my last. I really loved this book. I love the writing. This book came out in 2022 and it's about 170 pages and it was about a seven hour audiobook or so. This is a retelling of the Edgar Allan Poe short story called Fall of the House of Usher. So this is told in a first person point of view and we're following our main character who is named Alex. Alex is a retired soldier who's just recently gotten a letter to, from his childhood friends, Roderick and Madeline, asking them to come home to their childhood home to be with them because Madeline is not doing well and she's dying. They rush back and, and this big family home that they grew up going to is completely you know, dilapidated. It's falling apart. There's a creepy lake that's just sketchy. None of the local people will go to this house or visit this land or go anywhere near this lake. So we know something's happening. Something's weird is going on. There's a wonderful character named Mrs. Potter, who's a British mycologist who's studying the extraordinary mushrooms and fungi around the area. So that's who we kind of meet first. And she's great. She's so, you know, I hate to say stereotypical British, but she's that like fun, stereotypical British character and no nonsense. I really loved her. I really enjoyed her character a lot. Um, so we kind of meet with her and we're introduced to the fungus of the area and how it's a little bit weird and creepy. So we also, you know, once he gets there, he finds that Madeline is just looking horrific. There's something really wrong with her. Nobody knows. There's an American doctor that's been staying with them as well. And, you know, he's kind of stumped as to what's going on. Roderick is slowly starting to lose his mind a little bit over things. So there's a really creepy, nice, creepy element to everything. Um, and then, you know, we kind of see what happens from there. So what I really liked about this was I thought the writing was really nice. I loved the beautiful writing. I loved our main character's point of view. Also, I thought the, the world around was described really well. We have some weird stuff going on with the rabbits or the hares that are outside that are slightly possessed and acting weird. And then when we get to sort of the, the spiraling down, it's just the body horror is great. The fungal horror is great. And I really enjoyed this book. I thought it was great. Um, my only complaint, if I had to say one criticism, would be that I thought the ending was a little abrupt. But yeah, the, the ending was a tiny bit anticlimactic, but overall the whole book I really enjoyed. And, um, you know, so if you're a fan of horror and you need a little palate cleanser, something a little lighter in between your darker horror, I really recommend this because this was a fun horror for me. I really liked it. If you're somebody that has a phobia of fungus though, you know, go with caution, <laughs> definitely. And if you're somebody that's new to horror like me and you just kind of want to get started, I really recommend this book. It's short and it's fun and it's creepy and it's spooky and it's gross. So really great. I gave that uh, like four, four and a half stars or so. Okay. And the final book I wanted to tell you guys about is my favorite book of the month. This is my nonfiction read. I read it as audio and this is called The Body Keeps the Score. And this is by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. So this one was quite a long book. Uh, it was a 16 hour audiobook and about 450 pages or so. And it was really good. It was really good. This book was basically part memoir, part study into post-traumatic stress disorder and the ways that it physically changes your brain and your body. And then it also focuses on the upcoming treatments that people can do to heal from this and what pr practitioners and providers can do to guide their patients and help them have a more successful recovery. So phenomenal writing, phenomenal writing. This book is, is to me, it's a work of art. I mean, it, the amount of information that's in here is is phenomenal. It just, it covers so many different things. It's a really thorough example of, you know, stress and what happens and how that changes your brain and what it does to your brain, why you feel certain ways that you do, why you have different reactions, how you can feel that accumulation and years of post-traumatic stress within your body, within your joints, within your organs, within your, you know, everything. So phenomenal writing, a note on the audio, fantastic audio narrator. This was narrated by a professional audio narrator, not the author himself. So um, I felt the narrator did a fantastic job in with the terminology, the medical terminology, with the pacing, with adding the compassion in their voice during some of the more difficult scenes to read. So 
The first half of the book, of course, we talk about trauma and we're talking about the types of trauma that he's studied. We talk about what kind of treatments he started out doing back in the 1960s. You know, we've come such a long way with how mental health is cared for from, you know, hosing down people in mental asylums back in the earlier days, now to giving people autonomy and lots of different treatment options. And of course, the introduction of psychopharmacology and medications. Another thing I loved was that the way the book was written was very narrative nonfiction. So you're getting a personal account, you're getting storytelling, you're getting case accounts, patient testimonies and examples. So it's a lot of academic information, but it's told in a way that's not very overwhelming. So if I had to have any complaints, it would be that I felt like the focus on individual case studies and traumas was very heavy. So you're getting graphic descriptions of somebody's war veteran experience and what they saw. It was not easy to read. For the sexual abuse, you're getting detailed descriptions of what these kids experienced of their fathers and their close family members. You're just getting a lot of detailed traumatic accounts. And I don't know if that was fully necessary for the story. It felt a little bit, you know how when authors throw that trauma at you is kind of like, to suck you in. It felt a little bit like that. Um, so unfortunately, I feel like that's a detriment to the book that may prohibit many people from getting through the book. I did read a lot of reviews where trauma sufferers, you know, they had to DNF it. They couldn't read those scenes. So if there was a way that you could skip over these easily, I had the audio, so I don't know how it looks in the text itself. But if you're somebody that has been through severe trauma, but you're still interested in, in this book, you know, you don't have to read the trauma stuff. I don't recommend it. Another criticism I had maybe is that uh, it felt like there wasn't a lot of diversity. So we're getting a lot of male war veterans, not a lot of female points of views, or maybe he didn't work with a lot of females. Um, there was some descriptions of female victims as being gorgeous or, you know, thin, and that was kind of weird to read. So I can sense there was a tiny bit of, you know, misogyny in there. You know, I, I want to love this book so much, but I have to just point out a couple of those little details. So pharmacology, he also kind of rips apart the politics and corruptness within the drug industry and how there are medications that are so cheap and generic that work just as well as these higher priced medications. You know, that's a whole topic in itself, but he did bring that to light, which I thought was great. He talks about how the hormones in your body, for someone that has suffered trauma, how you're constantly in this fight or flight response. It never goes back down to a normal baseline like it does for people that haven't experienced this. So it talks about why people react the way they do in certain situations. You know, if you have somebody in your life that's very quick to like snap at you or quick to like be mean to others or very defensive, like chances are maybe they've been through a little bit of trauma and that is, you don't know what's going on inside their brains and their heads. So that's something to keep in mind. An interesting thing about trauma is that you can't really control if it happens to you or not. It's a little bit random. And especially for children that experience trauma, they're at the complete mercy of the adults around them and they didn't ask for it. They didn't deserve it. They, nobody should have to go through anything like what these people went through. So learning to accept that it is just something that happened and being able to change the way your brain stops reliving that trauma all the time because every time some of these people think about trauma, it's happening all over to them. There's no separation between the past and the present. So his mission was to find a way to help people tell a new story, to create new visualizations, to be able to revisit the trauma without reliving it, which I thought was amazing and so true. One thing that I love that he says is that a goal of his treatment is to help people that have experienced trauma to finally feel safe again in their bodies. And that's a really powerful thing to be able to accomplish. So, you know, trauma is something that you can't undo, but you can create new stories and pathways within yourself to heal from that and move on and leave it in the past. So the book itself was amazing. I really, really enjoyed it. The only thing, again, that prevented me from giving it a full five stars is the, the points I mentioned earlier. But, you know, I think this is a must read for people in the healthcare industry. I feel like it's a little bit more beneficial for people that work in this industry to read this rather than if you have trauma that is completely unresolved it's going to be hard it's, it would be hard to read this and so to end on that note it is always good and important to take care of yourself and to ask for help fantastic book 
fantastic reading month. I really enjoyed the books I read. I'm excited for the books coming up and I hope you guys enjoyed the review and I hope you all had a great reading month as well. I'm looking forward to catching up on everybody's videos that's going to talk about their wrap ups and everything. And if you don't have a YouTube channel, please let me know what your favorite book of the month was. And you guys take care. I appreciate every one of you. Hope you're enjoying the holiday season so far and I will see you guys soon.